Section two of The Rider on the White Horse by Theodor Storm, translated by Margarete Münsterberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2013. Well, he said, in the middle of the last century, or rather, to be more exact, before and after the middle of that century, there was a dikemaster here who knew more about dikes and slices than peasants and landowners usually do. But I suppose it was nevertheless not quite enough, for he had read little of what learned specialists had written about it. His knowledge, though he began in childhood, he had thought out all by himself. I dare say you have heard, sir, that the Frisians are good in arithmetic, and perhaps you have heard tell of our Hans Mommsen from Farntoft, who was a peasant and yet could make chronometers, telescopes, and organs. Well, the father of this man, who later became dikemaster, was made out of this same stuff. To be sure, only a little. He had a few fens where he planted turnips and beans and kept a cow grazing. Once in a while in the fall and spring he also surveyed land, and in winter, when the northwest wind blew outside and shook his shutters, he sat in his room to scratch and prick with his instruments. The boy usually would sit by and look away from his primer or Bible to watch his father measure and calculate, and would thrust his hand into his blond hair. And one evening he asked the old man why something that he had written down had to be just so, and could not be something different, and stated his own opinion about it. But his father, who did not know how to answer this, shook his head and said, That I cannot tell you. Anyway, it is so, and you are mistaken. If you want to know more, search for a book tomorrow in a box in our attic. Someone whose name is Euclid has written it. That will tell you. The next day the boy had run up to the attic and soon had found the book, for there were not many books in the house anyway, but his father laughed when he laid it in front of him on the table. It was a Dutch Euclid, and Dutch, although it was half German, neither of them understood. Yes, yes, he said, this book belonged to my father. He understood it. Is there no German Euclid up there? The boy who spoke little looked at his father quietly and said only, May I keep it? There isn't any German one. And when the old man nodded, he showed him a second half-torn little book. That too? he asked again. Take them both, said Tede Haien. They won't be of much use to you. But the second book was a little Dutch grammar, and as the winter was not over for a long while, by the time the gooseberries bloomed again in the garden, it had helped the boy so far that he could almost entirely understand his Euclid, which at that time was much in vogue. I know perfectly well, sir, the storyteller interrupted himself, that this same incident is also told of Hans Mommsen, but before his birth our people here have told the same of Hauke Haien. That was the name of the boy. You know well enough that as soon as a greater man has come, everything is heaped on him that his predecessor has done before him, either seriously or in fun. When the old man saw that the boy had no sense for cows or sheep, and scarcely noticed when the beans were in bloom, which is the joy of every marshman, and when he considered that his little place might be kept up by a farmer and a boy, but not by a half-scholar and a hired man, inasmuch as he himself had not been over-prosperous, he sent his big boy to the dike, where he had to cart earth from Easter until Martinmas. That will cure him of his Euclid, he said to himself. And the boy carted, but his Euclid he always had with him in his pocket, and when the workmen ate their breakfast or lunch, he sat on his upturned wheelbarrow with the book in his hand. In autumn, when the tide rose higher, and sometimes work had to be stopped, he did not go home with the others, but stayed, and sat with his hands clasped over his knees on the seaward slope of the dike, and for hours watched the sombre waves of the North Sea beat always higher and higher against the grass-grown scar of the dike. 
Not until the water washed over his feet and the foam sprayed his face did he move a few feet higher, only to stay and sit on. He did not hear the splash of the water or the scream of the gulls or strand birds that flew around him and almost grazed him with their wings, flashing their black eyes at his own, nor did he see how night spread over the wide wilderness of water. The only thing he saw was the edge of the surf, which at high tide was again and again hitting the same place with hard blows and before his very eyes washing away the grassy scar of the steep dike. After staring a long time, he would nod his head slowly and, without looking up, draw a curved line in the air, as if he could in this way give the dike a gentler slope. When it grew so dark that all earthly things vanished from his sight and only the surf roared in his ears, then he got up and marched home half-drenched. One night, when he came in this state into the room where his father was polishing his surveying instruments, the letter started. "'What have you been doing out there?' he cried. "'You might have drowned. The waters are biting into the dike today.' Hauke looked at him stubbornly. "'Don't you hear me? I say you might have drowned.' "'Yes,' said Hauke, "'but I'm not drowned.' "'No,' the old man answered after a while and looked into his face absently. "'Not this time.' But, Hauke returned, our dikes aren't worth anything. What's that, boy? The dikes, I say. What about the dikes? They're no good, father, replied Hauke. The old man laughed in his face. What's the matter with you, boy? I suppose you are the prodigy from Lübeck. But the boy would not be put down. The waterside is too steep, he said. If it happens some day as it has happened before, we can drown here behind the dike too. The old man pulled his tobacco out of his pocket, twisted off a piece and pushed it behind his teeth. And how many loads have you pushed today? He asked angrily, for he saw that the boy's work on the dike had not been able to chase away his brain work. I don't know, father, said the boy. About as many as the others did, or perhaps half a dozen more, but the dikes have got to be changed. Well, said the old man with a short laugh, perhaps you can manage to be made dike master, then you can change them. Yes, father, replied the boy. The old man looked at him and swallowed a few times. Then he walked out of the door. He did not know what to say to the boy. Even when, at the end of October, the work on the dike was over, his walk northward to the farm was the best entertainment for Hauke Haien. He looked forward to All Saints' Day, the time when the equinoctial storms were wont to rage, a day on which we say that Friesland has a good right to mourn, just as children nowadays look forward to Christmas. When an early flood was coming, one could be sure that in spite of storm and bad weather, he would be lying all alone far out on the dike, and when the gulls chattered, when the waters pounded against the dike, and as they rolled back swept big pieces of the grass cover with them into the sea, then one could have heard Hauke's furious laughter. "'You aren't good for anything!' he cried out into the noise. "'Just as the people are no good!' And at last, often in darkness, he trotted home from the wide water along the dike, until his tall figure had reached the low door under his father's thatch roof and slipped into the little room. Sometimes he had brought home a handful of clay. Then he sat down beside the old man, who now humoured him, and by the light of the thin tallow candle he kneaded all sorts of dike models, laid them in a flat dish with water, and tried to imitate the washing away by the waves. Or he took his slate and drew the profiles of the dikes toward the waterside as he thought they ought to be. He had no idea of keeping up intercourse with his schoolmates. It seemed, too, as if they did not care for this dreamer. 
When winter had come again and the frost had appeared, he wandered still farther out on the dike to points he had never reached before, until the boundless ice-covered sand flats lie before him. During the continuous frost in February, dead bodies were found washed ashore. They had lain on the frozen sand flats by the open sea. A young woman who had been present when they had taken the bodies into the village stood talking fluently with old Hyen. Don't you believe that they looked like people? she cried. No, like sea devils, heads as big as this. And she touched together the tips of her outspread and outstretched hands coal black and shiny like newly baked bread and the crabs had nibbled them and the children screamed when they saw them for old hyen this was nothing new i suppose they have floated in the water since november he said indifferently hauke stood by in silence but as soon as he could he sneaked out on the dike Nobody knew whether he wanted to look for more dead, or if he was drawn to the places now deserted by the horror that still clung to them. He ran on and on until he stood alone in the solitary waste, where only the winds blew over the dike, where there was nothing but the wailing voices of the great birds that shot by swiftly. To his left was the wide empty marshland, on the other side the endless beach with its sand flats now glistening with ice. It seemed as if the whole world lay in white death. Hauke remained standing on the dike, and his sharp eyes gazed far away. There was no sign of the dead, but when the invisible streams on the sand flats found their way beneath the ice, it rose and sank in stream-like lines. He ran home, but on one of the next nights he was out there again. In places the ice had now split, smoke clouds seemed to rise out of the cracks, and over the whole sand stretch a net of stream and mist seemed to be spun, which at evening mingled strangely with the twilight. Hauke stared at it with fixed eyes, for in the mist dark figures were walking up and down that seemed to him as big as human beings. Far off he saw them promenade back and forth by the steaming fissures, dignified but with strange frightening gestures with long necks and noses all at once they began to jump up and down like fools uncannily the big ones over the little ones the little ones over the big ones then they spread out and lost all shape what do they want are they ghosts of the drowned thought hauke hello he screamed out aloud into the night but they did not heed his cry and kept on with their strange antics. Then the terrible Norwegian sea spectres came to his mind, that an old captain had once told him about, who bore stubby bunches of sea-grass on their necks instead of heads. He did not run away, however, but dug the heels of his boots faster into the clay of the dike, and rigidly watched the farcical riot that was kept up before his eyes in the falling dust. "'Are you here in our parts, too?' he said in a hard voice. "'You shall not chase me away.' Not until darkness covered all things did he walk home with stiff, slow steps. But behind him he seemed to hear the rustling of wings and resounding screams. He did not look round, neither did he walk faster, and it was late when he came home. Yet he is said to have told neither his father nor anyone else about it. But many years after he took his feeble-minded little girl, with whom the Lord later had burdened him, out on the dike with him at the same time of day and year, and the same riot is said to have appeared then out on the sand flats. But he told her not to be afraid, that these things were only the herons and crows that seemed so big and horrible, and that they were getting fish out of the open cracks. God knows, the schoolmaster interrupted himself, there are all sorts of things on earth that could confuse a Christian heart, but Hauke was neither a fool nor a blockhead. As I made no response, he wanted to go on. But among the other guests, who till now had listened without making a sound, only filling the low room more and more thickly with tobacco smoke, 
there arose a sudden stir. First one, then another, then all turned toward the window. Outside, as one could see through the uncurtained glass, the storm was driving the clouds, and light and dark were chasing one another. But it seemed to me, too, as if I had seen the haggard rider whiz by on his white horse. "'Wait a little, schoolmaster,' said the dikemaster in a low voice. "'You don't need to be afraid, dikemaster,' laughed the little narrator. "'I have not slandered him and have no reason to do so.' And he looked up at him with his small, clever eyes. "'All right,' said the other. "'Let your glass be filled again.' And when that had been done and the listeners, most of them with rather anxious faces, had turned to him again, he went on with his story. Living thus by himself and liking best to associate only with sand and water and with scenes of solitude, Hauke grew into a long, lean fellow. It was a year after his confirmation that his life was suddenly changed, and this came about through the old white Angora cat, which old Trin Jan's son, who later perished at sea, had brought her on his return from a voyage to Spain. Trin lived a good way out on the dike in a little hut, and when the old woman did her chores in the house, this monster of a cat used to sit in front of the house door and blink into the summer day and at the peewits that flew past. When Hauke went by, the cat mewed at him, and Hauke nodded. Both knew how each felt toward the other. Now it was spring, and Hauke, as he was accustomed to do, often lay out on the dike, already farther out near the water, between beech pinks and the fragrant sea wormwood, and let the strong sun shine on him. He had gathered his pockets full of pebbles up on the higher land the day before, and when at low tide the sand flats were laid bare, and the little gay strand snipes whisked around them screaming, he quickly pulled out a stone and threw it after the birds. He had practiced this from earliest childhood on, and usually one of the birds remained lying on the ground, but often it was impossible to get at it. Hauke had sometimes thought of taking the cat with him and training him as a retriever. But there were hard places here and there on the sand. In this case he ran and got his prey himself. On his way back, if the cat was still sitting in front of the house door, the animal would utter piercing cries of uncontrollable greed until Hauke threw him one of the birds he had killed. Today, when he walked home, carrying his jacket on his shoulder, he was taking home only one unknown bird, but that seemed to have wings of gay silk and metal, and the cat mewed as usual when he saw him coming. But this time Hauke did not want to give up his prey. It may have been an ice bird, and he paid no attention to the greed of the animal. "'Wait your turn,' he called to him. "'Today for me, tomorrow for you. This is no food for a cat.' As the cat came carefully sneaking along, Hauke stood and looked at it, the bird was hanging from his hand, and the cat stood still with its paw raised. But it seemed that the young man did not know his cat friend too well, for, while he had turned his back on it and was just going on his way, he felt that with a sudden jerk his booty was torn from him, and at the same time a sharp claw cut into his flesh. A rage like that of a beast of prey shut into the young man's blood. Wildly he stretched out his arm, and in a flash had clutched a robber by his neck. With his fist he held the powerful animal high up, and choked it until its eyes bulged out among its rough hairs, not heeding that the strong hind paws were tearing his flesh. "'Hello!' he shouted and clutched him still more tightly. "'Let's see which of us two can stand it the longest!' Suddenly the hind legs of the big cat fell languidly down, and Hauke walked back a few steps and threw it against the hut of the old woman. As it did not stir, he turned round and continued his way home. But the Angora cat was the only treasure of her mistress. He was her companion and the only thing that her son, the sailor, had left her after he had met with sudden death here on the coast, when he had wanted to help his mother by fishing in the storm. 
Hauke had scarcely walked on a hundred steps, while he caught the blood from his wounds on a cloth, when he heard a shrill howling and screaming from the hut. He turned round, and, in front of it, saw the old woman lying on the ground, her grey hair was flying in the wind round her red headscarf. Dead! she cried, dead! and raised her lean arm threateningly against him. A curse on you! You have killed her, you good-for-nothing vagabond! You weren't good enough to brush her tail! She threw herself upon the animal, and with her apron she tenderly wiped off the blood that was still running from its nose and mouth. Then she began her screaming again. When will you be done? Hauke cried to her. Then let me tell you, I'll get you a cat that will be satisfied with the blood of mice and rats. Then he went on his way, apparently no longer concerned with anything. But the dead cat must have caused some confusion in his head, for when he came to the village, he passed by his father's house and the others, and walked on a good distance toward the south, on the dike toward the city. Meanwhile, Trin Jans, too, wandered on the dike in the same direction. In her arms she bore a burden wrapped in an old blue checkered pillowcase, and clasped it carefully as if it were a child, her grey hair fluttered in the light spring wind. "'What are you lugging there, Trina?' asked a peasant who met her. "'More than your house and farm,' replied the old woman, and walked on eagerly. When she came near the house of old Hyen, which lay below, she walked down to the house along the Act, as we call the cattle and footpaths that lead slantingly up and down the side of the dike. Old Tede Hyen was just standing in front of his door, looking at the water. "'Well, Trin,' he said, when she stood panting in front of him, and dug her crutch into the ground. "'What are you bringing us in your bag?' First let me into the room, Tede Hyen, then you shall see.' And her eyes looked at him with a strange gleam. "'Well, come along,' said the old man. What did he care about the eyes of the stupid woman? When both had entered, she went on. Take that old tobacco box and those writing things from the table. What do you always have to write for, anyway? All right, and now wipe it clean. And the old man, who was almost growing curious, did everything just as she said. Then she took the blue pillowcase at both ends and emptied the carcass of the big cat out on the table. "'There she is!' she cried. "'Your Hauke has killed her!' Thereupon she began to cry bitterly. She stroked the thick fur of the dead animal, laid its paws together, bent her long nose over its head, and whispered incomprehensible words of tenderness into its ears. Tede Hayen watched this. "'Is that so?' he said. "'Hauke has killed her?' He did not know what to do with the howling woman. She nodded at him grimly. Yes, yes, God knows that's what he has done. And she wiped the tears from her eyes with her hand, crippled by rheumatism. No child, no live thing any more, she complained. And you know yourself how it is after all Saints Day, when we old people feel our legs shiver at night in bed, and instead of sleeping we hear the northwest wind rattle against the shutters. I don't like to hear it. Tede Hyen, it comes from where my boy sank to death in the quicksand. Tede Hyen nodded, and the old woman stroked the fur of her dead cat. But this one here, she began again, when I would sit by my spinning wheel, there she would sit with me and spin too, and look at me with her green eyes. And when I grew cold and crept into my bed, then it wasn't long before she jumped up to me and lay down on my chilly legs, and we both slept as warmly together as if I still had my young sweetheart in bed. The old woman, as if she were waiting for his assent to this remembrance, looked with her gleaming eyes at the old man standing beside her at the table. Tede Hayen, however, said thoughtfully, I know a way out for you, Trin Jans and he went to his strong box and took a silver coin out of the drawer. You say that Hauke has robbed your animal of life, and I know you don't lie, but here is a crown piece from time of Christian the Fourth. 
Go and buy a tanned lambskin with it for your cold legs. And when our cat has kittens, you may pick out the biggest of them. Both together, I suppose, will make up for an Angora cat feeble from old age. Take your beast, and if you want to, take it to the tanner in town, but keep your mouth shut and don't tell that it has lain on my honest table. During this speech, the woman had already snatched the crown and stowed it away in a little bag that she carried under her skirts. Then she tucked the cat back into the pillowcase, wiped the bloodstains from the table with her apron, and stalked out of the door. "'Don't you forget the young cat!' she called back. After a while, when old Hyen was walking up and down in the narrow little room, Hauke stepped in and tossed his bright bird onto the table. But when he saw the still recognizable bloodstain on the clean white top, he asked as if, by the way, What's that? His father stood still. That's blood that you have spilled. The young man flushed hotly. Why, has Trin Jans been here with her cat? The old man nodded. Why did you kill it? Hauke uncovered his bleeding arm. That's why he said. She had torn my bird away from me. Thereupon the old man said nothing. For a time he began to walk up and down, then he stood still in front of the young man and looked at him for a while almost absently. This affair with the cat I have made all right, he said. But look, Hauke, this place is too small. Two people can't stay on it. It is time you got a job. Yes, father, replied Hauke. I have been thinking something of the sort myself. Why? asked the old man. Well, one gets wild inside unless one can let it out on a decent piece of work. Is that so? said the old man. And that's why you have killed the Angora cat. That might easily lead to something worse. You may be right, father. But the dikemaster has discharged his farmhand. I could do that work all right. The old man began to walk up and down, and meanwhile spat out the black tobacco. <sighs> the dikemaster is a blockhead, as stupid as a goose. He's dikemaster only because his father and grandfather have been the same, and on account of his twenty-nine fens. Round Martinmas, when the dike and slice bills have to be settled, then he feeds the schoolmaster on roast goose and meat and wheat buns, and sits by and nods while the other man runs down the columns of figures with his pen and says, Yes, yes, schoolmaster, God reward you, how finely you calculate. But when the schoolmaster can't or won't, then he has to go at it himself and sit scribbling and striking out again, his big stupid head growing red and hot, his eyes bulging out like glass balls, as if his little bit of sense wanted to get out that way. The young man stood up straight in front of his father and marvelled at his talking. He had never heard him speak like that. Yes, God knows, he said. No doubt he is stupid. But his daughter, Elke, she can calculate. The old man looked at him sharply. Hallo, Hauke! he exclaimed. What do you know about Elke Volkerts? Nothing, father. Only the schoolmaster has told me. The old man made no reply. He only pushed his piece of tobacco thoughtfully from one cheek into the other. And you think, he said, that you can help in the counting there too? Oh, yes, father. That would work all right the son replied, and there was a serious twitching about his mouth. The old man shook his head. Well, go if you like. Go and try your luck. Thanks, father, said Hauke, and climbed up to his sleeping place in the garret. There he sat down on the edge of the bed and pondered why his father had shouted at him so when he had mentioned Elke Volkert's. To be sure, he knew the slender eighteen-year-old girl with the tanned, narrow face and the dark eyebrows that ran into each other over the stubborn eyes and the slender nose, but he had scarcely spoken a word to her. Now, if he should go to old Tede Folkert's, 
he would look at her more and see what there was about the girl. Right off he wanted to go, so that no one else could snatch the position away from him. It was now scarcely evening. And so he put on his Sunday coat and his best boots and started out in good spirits. End of section 2